G'day everybody, thank you for joining Ross and Jono once again. And uh, we left off last week talking about one of the most amazing archaeological discoveries of all time. That of course was the Moabitica Stone or the Meshastella. And we talked about that and what we're about to talk about is the Moabitica affair uh, yeah. that uh, Shapira was wrapped up in. And uh, the reason why uh, this occurred, obviously, is because there was a massive frenzy to get more uh, relics, if you like, ancient relics, particularly if they had yep. anything to do with the Bible, from Moab. If if uh, if the Meshastella is in Moab, if we found this, this is very, very important. Maybe there's more. Everybody quick start digging in the sand, right? Um, yep. And as it turns out, uh, Shapira is the man and he, he, he has a collection, a substantial collection. Everybody wants it. There is a frenzy. And uh, this is the situation. We're going to unpack that with some additional information that uh, uh, isn't in the book. But the textbook that we are using, of course, is the Moses Scroll. And uh, if you haven't got it, oh, oh, here's some news. Uh, if you haven't got it, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it in hardcover. You can get it in paperback. You can get it in Kindle immediately. But also, Ross, there's a new format. What's that? You, you can get it in audio now. Jono, if you're... You get look, it in some audio. People, some people don't like to read. Now, I had on my list for 2024, I always make a really good list of what I'm going to attempt to do, and I try to get a lot done. Uh, but one of the things was audio book for the Moses Scroll. And just quickly, the other day, I was at my desk, an email comes from Amazon and said, you, author at Amazon, have been selected. I don't know how big a deal this is, but it was perfect for me. It said, you can try our new beta AI-assisted Mm -hmm. um, uh, audiobook. So I log in, I quickly go to my uh, page, and it said, pick one of these voices. And they had all kind of beautiful voices. Oh, and obviously like, you picked the, the Aussie accent, right? That's what you picked? I, I did. I was looking for something with a little bit of Australian accent because it would remind me of you reading to me, and I always enjoy that every night we get together. <laughs> but I couldn't find exactly... So I, I tossed between uh, uh, a man, a woman, an English... An, Anyway, I, I picked the one I thought worked the best, and I said, give me that book. And, Jono, I'm telling you, from the time I received notice until this hmm. thing was up on Amazon was just a couple of hours. So, yes, they can get it on uh, on Amazon as an audio book. How but much look, is it just to get an audio book? Let's well, how much audio book these days? Uh, I think it's eight bucks or something. It's, it's cheap, probably eight dollars. That's right. All right. That's right. Something like now, that. All right. Good. Good. You mentioned you mentioned the perfect segue to get us into this Morbidica. I call it the Morbidica scandal. Now I want mm. people that are listening tonight to let me know which you prefer. Do you prefer because there's going to be a book on this too? Do you prefer that I call the book the Morbite scandal or the Morbidica scandal? Now you you may want to save your answer until the end because. You have to understand what the Moabitica are. So let's let's talk about mm. that. Just as well, you I said. Tell you what, yep. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, before we define what the Moabitica are, I mean, primarily they are a particular style of find. And, uh, and I thought it might just uh, be handy to remind listeners that uh, maybe three or four programs ago, uh, you and I did a show on a – uh, an archaeological find that uh, was actually found in the 80s was thought to be fake. And then yeah. recently, after uh, tests that available to oh, us yeah. today, was then deemed to be original, like an authentic find. And that was the, um, the Jeroboam II the Buller uh, right. from, from the seal, right, um, that the, uh, the half shekel was modeled on and so on and so forth. So, uh, today's half shekel, so or whenever it was, right? Um, so there, there is that. So I'm just, I'm just raising the the fact that um, again, there was a buller that was deemed to be fake, has now been uh, deemed to be authentic. You can find that in the news. At the same time, we highlighted recently and uh, several months ago uh, what is known as the Darius inscription. That was a uh, a piece of pottery with the name Darius uh, inscribed upon it, yeah. uh, found at Lachish, and that was deemed to be an amazing discovery, an, an authentic discovery. It was reported all over the place, and a few days later, lo and behold, and we were very excited about it and did a show on it. Uh, we did a show then, on it, yeah, right away. 
We did a show on it, Ross, and then a few days later, it was deemed to be fake. Why? Because the person who was a, a, a lecturer, I think she was a lecturer yeah. in, um, in these particular languages, came forward and she said, oh, no, 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 don't get too excited. I actually did that. <laughs> she, I was just, I was showing my students, you know, I picked up a piece she's of pottery. A professor, da, 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 da. She's a professor, very skilled, and I want to under, underscore very skilled in mm. Aramaic, ancient Aramaic, and she, she whittled that, just wrote that bad boy out and passed it off. Fooled the and whole. Threw it back. Oh well, she goodness, didn't intend yeah. to. She just threw it back on the ground, not oh, thinking no. anything would happen. But it, yeah. it it sat there for a number of months, the rain, you know, draining over it, and 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 this particular um, piece of pottery formed what they called what a patina. Is that is that a what patina. it's called? Patina. That's right. Um, uh, from from the wash of the rain, just for a few months, someone yep. discovers it, a tourist or whatever, and they're like, ah, it's a thing. And look, we've done that. We do that in various places when we go to Lakish, when we go to Arad, when we yeah. go to anywhere, Sheila or whatever, picking up pieces of pottery and looking at them to see if there's any inscriptions on them, right? Um, but it was decided it was a it was an authentic thing. Later, a few days later, um, she reveals, no, 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 I did that. <laughs> right? Now, so, and so, so to it your raises point, the question, me, Ross. Yeah, to, yes, yeah. this is the point. How do we know? How how certain can we be? So we have an enormous amount of what is known as the Moabitica, a massive collection that is accumulated by Moses Shapira. First, so here are some of the questions that I want you to answer, Ross. Right, how does I'm he ready. accumulate these uh, this collection? How does it come to him? Uh, yep. Secondly, how do we really know if any of them are fake or if any of them are authentic? Go right. Okay. Okay. Those are those are some big ones. Now, you let so let's go to the beginning in 1868 when Klein, when Frederick Augustus Klein finds the uh, Moabitic, uh, the Moabite stone, the Mesha stone. Mm. He says in his first report, when he first publishes his report, he says, "You know, this ought to make us look harder in this region east of the Jordan River." Uh, for mm -hmm. antiquities, just like you said. So what happens is, August 1868, it does create almost like uh, here in the States, we had a gold rush out west. Well, this is a uh, Morbidica culture race out east mm. in the wild, mm. wild east. Here's the thing about going east of the Jordan Rift in the 19th century. Jono, it was untamed. It was wild. You still mm. think it's kind of wild. You tell me this every time we go there. You say, Ross, wow. I would be so happy to cross back into, uh, into Israel. Israel. It, oh, it, and word. it is a little wild. It's like it's right under the surface. But but in the 19th yeah. century, this was really, really intense. I mean, Bedouin mm. are uh, unruly. They they rule the lands, and, and if you— uh, if you want to pass through the land, if you want to do anything in that region, you have to have connections with these mm. uh, these uh, uh, Bedouin. So Shapira loves the desert, and one of the things that I would encourage people, if you want to, when I was doing research for the Moses Scroll, one of the books that I read is called "The Little Daughter of Jerusalem." We've mentioned it mm -hmm. on a couple of our shows That's already. Right. Mm -hmm. It is yep. the recollections of, or they represent the recollections of his daughter, Miriam. And mm. Miriam tells the story that she remembers as a child growing up, her father going for long periods of time to visit his friends in the desert. And he would dress in typical, you know, like we're familiar with uh, Lawrence of Arabia. He yeah, was dressed like this. I mean, he would go yeah. with his buddies and, and be gone weeks at a time. In fact, she reports, all this is necessary background material, she reports that a uh, a Bedouin sheep by the name of Ali Diab, Ali Diab mm -hmm. uh, spent time in her house with his, kind of his entourage of Bedouin chiefs, you know. Mm. He's, the, he's the prince of the desert, basically, Ali Diab. Shapira works with him. And... Allegedly, on the heels of the discovery of the Moabite stone. Now, remember, mm -hmm. Miriam Harry says that her father uncovered the Miriam the uh, Moabite stone. I believe that because right mm -hmm. after that, the dates work. There are several Moabitish items that show mm -hmm. up in Shapira's shop. Remember, he's got the best shop in Jerusalem, according mm -hmm. to Bedeker's guide. 
So if people would come to Jerusalem and they'd go to Christian Street and they would go to his shop and they'd say, man, I'm reading about the Moabite stone, and Shapiro would say, yes, look, I have, have these, these Moabite things. engravings. Now, now, it's important haven't... to remind everyone that, of course, uh, Reverend Klein didn't discover the, the Meshastella. He was That's shown right. the Meshastella. Right. The Meshastella was already uncovered. Uh, it was already above ground, uh, and it, 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 it was shown to him. So someone else had That's right. uh, discovered Someone it. had so excavated it. it. Yeah. It's quite possible, absolutely. Okay, continue. Now, when I was writing the Moses Scroll, I became convinced, based on an accumulation of evidence, that the scroll itself was authentic. But one thing was always in my face, Jonah. Everything that I read, all of my research said, Shapira was involved in a scandal involving morbidic Items, idols, mm. some were in the form of people, some were in the form of objects, some of these were crude, some of these were very, very crude, and, and all of this evidence, it seemed almost universally accepted that Shapira was involved in a scandal. Now, let me, let me say that not all, in fact, most didn't allege that he created this but that mm. he was a dupe, he was sold a bill of goods, he was, he was, he was they passed through the, the shop. That's yeah, right. That's right. And so, so if, if, if listeners might remember that uh, we had a discussion in recent programs uh, about the similarities between the Dead Sea Scroll find and the uh, Moses Scroll find and the fact that yeah. the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves were tainted initially uh, with the suggestion of some sort of forgery because of the Shapiro right. Scroll uh, saga only seven decades earlier uh, in regards to the, to the Moses scroll, but the, the Moses scroll itself was uh, in, uh, tainted with the uh, uh, stain of forgery because of the, the Moabitica. And the question That's really does right. become, is it fair? Is it really, really fair? Let's, let, let's evaluate that. Go, go ahead. Well, yeah, so you're, you're, you're absolutely correct. And so when I wrote the Moses Scroll, I, again, I was convinced I had other scholars who supported the idea that it was authentic. Uh, James Tabor, even though that's not his field, he also had done deep, deep research. And we both knew mutual people who it is their field who said that the Shapira manuscript was real. Uh, mm. You know, when when you have James Charlesworth tell you face to face, you know mm. it was authentic. It's something uh, worth uh, it, looking at. This it, right. So it's certainly worth looking at. Okay. So the thing about the Moabitica, though, is again, as I was doing the research, I said if I spend too much time writing the story of the Moabitica, then almost immediately people are going to get turned off, and they'll say, "Well." It looks like the evidence supports maybe that was a forgery, and so now Shapira's tainted with the idea of forgery, and the case is closed. Mm. So I wanted to somehow mm. give enough of the story to get through that part and then move into the scroll and let it stand on its own two feet, which right. I did. Now, mm. in the subsequent years, uh, thanks to the Tylers and others who've helped me along the way, I've accumulated a massive amount of research and continue working on this to this day that suggest, uh, well, I don't want to go there yet, but that tell the whole story of the Moabitica. So I'm going to do just very high level, please jump in as you feel the need. Mm. Let me just say mm. that in um, April, on April the 2nd of 1872, so remember, mm -hmm. August of 1868 is the discovery of the Moabite stone. Uh, Shapira says, I have it in writing, that on April the 2nd, 1872, the first piece of Moabitica hits his shop. But it hits his shop in a collection. Quite a few of these are brought to his shop, and, and he's told, look, we found these in the sands of Moab. Shapira begins to go on these expeditions with uh, not only Salim Al-Khari, who works with him, but with mm. other Arabs, particularly Ali Diab. Now, I have validated that Ali Diab was the king of the desert, 
uh, during this time. I mean, he was mm -hmm. the man over mm -hmm. all the other tribes. He's a, a chief of the Adwan, A-D-W-A-N, the Adwan tribe. So I know of this guy. This guy is well known in the 19th century. He's coming to Shapira and saying, my friend, my brother, hugs him. Look, I bring these gifts to you. You come see me. We go look. And, and that's what happens. So he begins to go and bring these things back. Now, these collections are quickly noticed by locals in Jerusalem. In the year 1872 already, the leader of the German Protestant community by the name of Wesser, W-E-S-E-R, notices in Shapira's shop. Remember, Shapira's wife, Rosette, is, is German. He's a yep. Protestant. The Protestant community in Jerusalem is pretty small. Mm. And, and they tell... He, Vesser, sends notice to Germany and says, you're not going to believe this. Here's some sketches. Shapira is working with Ali Diab in the desert in Jordan, and there he's finding these items. They have some have writing on them. Mm. So he begins to collect them. Now, I want to I get some of your thoughts on this in a minute, Jonah. Let me lay this one piece out. If you remember... The Germans, because in 1868, remember, it's Klein who is associated with the Prussians. They were the ones who wanted to buy the Moabite stone, the Meshastella, but the French weaseled in because of Claremont mm -hmm. Gano, Claremont Gano, mm -hmm. snatched it. So right. what the Germans don't want, and remember, in the 19th century, you had these powerhouse nations beginning to mm -hmm. uh, evolve. You have Germany, and you have France, and you have England. America's not so much in the fight yet, but these three in particular are battling over who's going to have the next great treasure to bring to their, their home. Sure. The Germans don't want to get beat again. So when they hear through the German Protestant Wessler that Shapira, who's also tied in with the Germans, and he wants German uh, papers, he wants to to get papers mm. with the German uh, country. He wants nationality. So they know he's an inside man. They tell Shapira, whatever happens, we'll buy them all. And Shapira said, okay, well, we're just now getting all this. And, and the Germans say, no, 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 do not sell one of these, whatever it is you're putting in your shop. We want them all. Now, I've got some figures here. Uh, the first collection, Jonah, by the way, the whole Moabitica scandal covers a period from about uh, April 2nd, not about, I did exactly, April 2nd, 1872, until 1876. By 76, pretty much really? a closed case. So yeah, it's a four-year it ordeal. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so yeah. if I remember correctly, I think the initial collection was 911 pieces. Is that correct? That's, that's right. Look, here are the stats. Get this. You're exactly right. 911 pieces, of which 465 were inscribed or had writing on them. Some of the letters are raised, some are inscribed. For so that's 51% have inscriptions, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, this first collection, uh, some of you know the story, but but uh, you had people like Claude Condor, the celebrated uh, yes. uh, military commander and mm -hmm. scholar, he and a guy by the name of Tyrit, uh, Tyrit Drake, both mm -hmm. working through the under the auspices of the PEF, they came and drew uh, sketches of these beautiful watercolors. By the way, mm. again, some quite the crude. artist Condor. Yeah. Oh my um, God. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't he what? And uh, and and my understanding, Ross, and uh, tell me if this is correct. Uh, they're doing so with 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 much excitement, as uh, from the understanding that this is all genuine stuff. They uh, yep. he, he sketches a lot of these, and a lot of them are really quite crude. We can talk about the nature of, of some That's of those right. uh, in a minute, if you like. And um, you, I just wanted to say that you actually had uh, thanks to Dave. You and Dave went to the um, and Patty, uh, the yeah, Palestine Exploration and Patty to the Palestine yep. Exploration Fund in um, in London. And you got to hold some of Condor's. Uh, what was it that you actually actually held in your hands? We we actually both got to hold the the drawings, which are like you said, these watercolor. It's amazing. 
Uh, mm. But we also, uh, we actually got to hold a couple of the pieces of Moabitica pottery. And uh, one of my favorite uh, days of my life, actually, was uh, Patty and I, in particular, were working closely with the, the staff there at the PEF, and we were, we were holding these, uh, Felicity Cobbing is the director there, and she opened up the whole thing for us. We, I mean, mm. I was expecting to get, you know, just a little bit of uh, maybe Q&A time where there's some copies made of something. But when she, she really just was, uh, opened the door wide open. So we held That's some great. of the Moabitica and yeah. uh, we read the things that were there at the PEF on the Moabitica. But, but like you said, so Condor and Drake are sending, they're in Jerusalem. They're hmm. writing, sending these drawings and sending notices, 1872, 1873 even, back to England saying, look, we, we need you to know. Now, the Germans are saying they're going to buy them all. So the hmm. English weren't convinced that they were authentic. Almost immediately, there was some uh, hesitation early on. Not, oh, not with that? Condor, not with Drake. Oh, but there oh, were okay. some. There were some who who just weren't convinced yet, and they were just being cautious. Can I ask you a question? So uh, yeah, Drake yeah. and Condor were they were they documenting these and sending it back to England in the hope that England might uh, that the museum might purchase these pieces? Uh, is that what they were trying to spark? You know, it from their writings, it doesn't appear that they they even moved on the question of purchase yet. There there was a gentlemanly. Mm. Except for uh, Claremont Gagneau, most of these people in the 19th century, <clears throat> except Claremont Gagneau, were very gentlemanlike. In other words, once the deal was started with Germany, it wasn't that they were sending these to England to say, we're going to swoop in and get them, but they huh. were saying, this is the next greatest biblical discovery. Remember, the world okay. is on, it, it's on a pinnacle of excitement after the discovery of the Mesha Stone. <clears throat> because uh -huh. what we think we've discovered, I'm putting me back in the 19th century because sure. I feel like I'm there most of the time. I, in fact, if you could see my desk, I have a calendar from 1872 and every newspaper article about this material. 73, yeah. same thing. 74, Again, the Athenium was, was all over it, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, But, but what, what happened was is everybody in the world is going to be talking about this discovery and you don't want to get left behind if it's authentic. So Vesser writes to a scholar by the name of Constantine Schlotman, who is at Halle. Schlotman hmm. is a brilliant scholar. He just recently, in 1868, uh, held off people who were saying that the Moabite stone was fake. He proved mm. that it was authentic, at least and there in were. satisfaction. And of, there were there people were. doing that as well. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, mm -hmm. so Schlotman is a big deal. Now, Schlotman, when he looks at the drawings and uh, that are coming to him from Vesser, he, he writes back and forth with the people in Jerusalem. He becomes convinced that the Moabitica are authentic testaments to a long-lost Moabite culture. Now, he's a linguist too, Jonah, but one thing he notices, because everybody notices, is mm. there are some very big problematic questions associated with the paleography, the letter forms, the everything about this. And there are three main things uh, with the paleography. One, they have letter forms that they're not familiar with. Mm -hmm. the letter forms they think are anachronistic. In other words, if the pitch is that these Moabitic items date back to the 9th century BCE, like the Moabite stone, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you have some alphabets uh, also included, sometimes mixed with ancient, what appear to be Phoenician or Moabitic, and some are um, uh, much later Arab forms of writing. So if I was to play devil's advocate, Ross, yeah, uh, if if we were to say that um, perhaps a let's say a factory, a pottery factory, or a stone carving factory opens up in secret to produce the Moabitica, and uh, and they say to the workers, listen, uh, the, the the Europeans love th this old language, and look, these are the letters that we have available to us on the 
on the measure stellar. Uh, and here's some other examples. And they don't know uh, yeah. what era these particular examples are from, but it's some sort of Paleo-Hebrew. Throw some of that on there because they love that stuff apparently and it makes it yeah. worth more. So they may have taken from different eras maybe if yeah. these yeah. are uh, forged items. Go ahead. And, and you're you're exactly right. And that's what most people said. They said, listen, if, if you're going to have 9th century BCE writing on an item that was baked in a kiln in the 9th century BCE, you're probably not going to have this other form of writing, which is clearly dated to about the 3rd century BCE. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. And, and they're mixed together. And here's another thing. There is in ancient writing what is called a ligature. A ligature is, uh, think of it like this. It's sort of a cursive form where you connect one letter to the next letter uh, oh, through a really? series of connecting lines. Well, that was the thing. That was the thing in the Moabitica. We have uh, excessive amounts of ligatures on those pieces which had writing. Now, and 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 yeah. is this style? Ross, sorry to interrupt, but, uh, yeah. if I understand you correctly, is this particular style a style that we see in uh, in latter centuries? Uh, well, it's a newer style that well, that perhaps has appeared on what is supposed to be an older item. Is this what we're to understand, or is it unique to that um, uh, collection? You you have some uh, that spans across various different periods, so you do see. Oh, okay. Uh, according, the, the argument wasn't that we don't expect to see any ligatures. That's not mm. the point. But it's mm. that they they felt like the mixing of the alphabets and the the excessive amounts of ligatures really kind of gave them a red flag. And and I'm not suggesting that they shouldn't have been flagged. But but nonetheless, mm. one thing that that we see is that also that a lot of the problem, air quotes, problems with this material is that that which is written on, by the way, my totals, I did the math, 32% oh. of all uh, of the Moabitica that are accounted for, primarily yep. from Shapira's works, which we'll talk about, his data is almost impeccable. Every time we have it, we rejoice, is 32% of all are inscribed. Uh, of the first collection, 51%. The second collection, only 12%. The third collection is 17% for a, an average total, 1,814 pieces total, 593 inscribed. That's 32%. Check my math. I'm so not have, good at math. So, so yeah. almost one-third, almost one-third yeah. in, includes inscriptions, and there is a question about... Uh, the letter forms. Okay, that's one thing. But then the next and, question becomes: yep. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I was going to say not not just the letter forms. Some there's no problem with, but you know mm. the mixing, as I mentioned. But then the other thing is: what does it say, or what do I was these just pieces about to say. say? What are the words? Are, do, yeah. are there actual words that we recognize? Are there sentences or phrases that are coherent, hey. or is it just a, a jumble of letters? Ross, go ahead. Uh, there, there's a little of both. Now, let me let me say a lot of what I've done to this point has been reliant upon other people. Jono, I'm not an expert at anything that I do, uh, but I am very thorough, if I can say that. And, and I don't tend to like to rely on what someone else told me and wrote about in an academic hmm. journal. If I if I get the sure. data, I may not be able to do it today. I may not have time to do hmm. it today, but I will. At best of my, without a vow, if I'm interested, I'm going to look at the data. So here's what Dave, uh, Patty, and I got. Uh, we mm -hmm. were alerted uh, by uh, Idan Dershowitz, the author of uh, the the other, the academic book, The yeah. Valediction of Moses, uh, also saying uh, that he believes it's authentic. He noted he knew that I'm researching the Moabitica, so he contacted me and he said, "Hey, are you aware?" that in the Stotts Bibliotheque in Berlin, there is a book in Shapira's hand where he notated details, including what the inscription is on all of these pieces of Moabitica. He said, mm. beyond that, I don't know, is it uh, the, the first collection, second, I don't know any of that, but there is this book. So Dave authorized me to work 
with with uh, his generosity, he said, I'll pay for it, but you do the legwork, contact the library, and so forth. So we went in uh, a couple of years ago to Berlin, hmm. and we went to the Stotts Bibliothek, and we got a digital copy of that book made. We had to work through the, the library there. Now, I have all of that in digital format, and I'm going hmm. through and I'm validating a couple of things. What we believe, Jono, and we believe this, I believe this, and I'm looking into mm. it, it, you know, I have to validate this is either going to stand or it isn't. Mm. I'm of the opinion that initially when these items start showing up, they're, they're authentic. Now, you, you say, well, how do you know that? The experts are saying that they're looking at this and they felt that they were authentic in that initial wave. And and we're I'm going to jump ahead just for a moment, and then we'll come back and fill in some data. But but I'll say this: when Shapira was when he told the Germans, "Okay, you tell me what you want to buy," they said, "We want to buy it all." He brings them ultimately parts of the collection to Germany. Now they've seen some of it; they've sent sketches, but he actually packs some up and brings it to Berlin. They see hmm. it; they get their experts to look at it, and they say, "We want to buy it," just like we said. He says, uh, "Hold on, I, and I have it in writing. It's in fact, it's in the Moses Scroll. We I recorded this in the book. He writes that he told him, I don't want to sell it until you've had time to look closely, because he said I think some of the more recent discoveries that have been brought to me are not authentic." Right. Okay. So he puts the ball in their court and he says, you guys are the experts. You guys are the buyers. Buyer beware. Yeah. You have to validate this stuff because I'm not convinced myself that all of it is authentic. That's this right. is, and this is in the, and you're, what you're saying is this is the latter collection um, that he's referring to. And in total, he ends up with a collection. Did you say what, 1,700? Pieces, well, is that right? There, there are total what we what I've now counted eighteen hundred and fourteen pieces total. Oh wow! About seventeen are estimated to have been sold to the Germans. But here's the deal: so they he told them, look, make sure they said you just go find more. So this mm. is early in the process. So he goes back and he tells his Arab connections, they want more guys. The Germans want more, and they said, "Well, Keep okay. Digging. Oh, look, I think we've got some more. You like to come with the writing, or you, you, you know, whatever." Now, Russ, and, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Let me just say that um, if there's a bunch of old pottery lying around um, uh, in in Moab, right in um, in the desert, is it going to be worth anything? I mean, it's been there for for a long, long time. Is it worth anything to the better ones? Did they decorate their um, uh, their tents with this stuff. Would they take it back and go? Oh, look, it's another piece of pottery, you know, from our ancestors. Maybe it's good luck charm. I'll, I'll, I'll put it here like a garden gnome. Is that is that what's going on, <laughs> or or is it just more of the same? Like, is it something they're used to seeing? You know, sort of um, when when the wind, uh, the harsh wind blows, and all of a sudden there's some stuff that's sort of ah, uh, some more pottery. Um, uh, my, my my question is, all of a sudden. These things are worth a great deal of money, and all of a sudden, there's a great um, uh, uh, attention, uh, yeah. if you like, given to uh, these things that, that that perhaps they were used to just sort of seeing around and didn't see a great deal of value with. Um, it, I, I just wonder. I just wonder. Then, is it possible that they just started digging, 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 and they, there may well have been ancient. Um, uh, factories uh, that 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 developed these sort of things at, that just over time uh, collections of this sort of stuff just got covered in the sand and they all of a sudden have hit the jackpot and look we've got heaps of it here we've got heaps of quit dig 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 yeah get it out apparently it's worth money now is that a possibility yeah definitely it's a possibility in fact let me tell you from from accounts that we've read of English speaking uh, explorer types from the 19th century who really got to know the Arab culture. What we find from people like Mosul and, and uh, Lawrence of Arabia even a little bit later, but what we find is that there, there is, you've kind of hit on all the, the options, but the one mm. thing is that there is an association of an item that is from antiquity, if it's in a cave, if it's buried under my tent or under my sheep mm. yard or whatever, 
it's bringing blessing to the land. You leave it in situ, in in uh, in its place. You don't disturb it. It's it's part of our. It's it's us. It's we are the land. The land. Um, they don't quite do that much, but you you get hmm. the point. Don't don't mess with. It. But here's the deal. But as the world turned. And as the world changed and Westerners began to come and, and they're, you know, they're like, look, we can make you wealthy. We can, we can uh, benefit you and your family. We can raise you up from this. And, and, mm. and if you can help us find some of these treasures, which we value. And, and so it was a bargaining thing. And, and, and we see this in the story of the Moabite stone. We see it in the story of the Shapira manuscript strips. We see it in the story of these Morbidica items. So, hmm. but what happens is, as is the case, unfortunately, with humans, uh, a lot of times uh, there is a selling of the soul. You know, things hmm. which might have been considered sacred, there's a cost, there's a price, there's a price tag. And I don't want to mm-hmm. curse my land, but you give me enough money, I'm willing to sling a chance, you know. So, and of course, the so other option is that's what uh, if this is worth a lot of money to you, yeah, we can find more and in a secret factory perhaps produce, and this is the conspiracy theory behind it. Yeah. Nevertheless, um, <clears throat> Shapira says to them, I'm not 100%. I just don't know if this uh, is all of yeah. it. You have to validate this if you want to buy it. You are the experts. You've got to validate it. What does Schlopman do? He, uh, Schlopman begins to write publicly begins to publish in uh, the Journal uh, for Palestinian Studies, the DMG, uh, uh, I think it are the initials, but anyway, for, for the uh, academic journal for the biblical study of Palestine, as it's called in mm-hmm. Ottoman mm-hmm. Uh, 19th century, he begins to write articles and even begins to make attempts to interpret these uh, arrangements of letters. Now, listen, it's it's not as you might imagine, like the Moabite stone, the Meshastella is begin on the right, go all the way to the left, hmm. and go to the next line. lines. And, and yeah. it's, it's, it's this form. There are names for all hmm. these styles of writing. Earlier forms of writing, we know, for instance, the big, you and I have been watching closely, uh, Gershon Galil, uh, the hmm. scholar at Haifa. You know, he, he describes the style some called, of this. Uh, boss- what, what's it yeah, called? Boss, it yeah, the where it's like a, a cow is going this way to uh, to tread a, a field, you know. It, mm. We see some of this in early Canaanite language, what we might call proto-Canaanite or even proto-alphabetic uh, mm. are two various ways of describing very early forms. It may be all over the place. So, for instance, mm. to use our example of Galil, he says on this lead tablet, I mean— most scholars say he's seeing things that aren't there, but he sees all these letters that say, cursed are you, cursed are you, cursed, 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 cursed are you, hmm. cursed, die, 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 cursed, be <laughs> Jehovah on you, you cursed thing. But, but he, he sees, sees that and in, the letters are all over the place. That, that's right. They sort yeah. of follow around and you've got to follow where the next letter is and this makes sense and therefore it says, right. There, um, and there but is it is this, a style. It's a particular yeah, style, yeah. It, and so it's almost you have – Here's one idea. One idea is that that Schlotman wants so badly for this to be authentic and believes, as we say, in his heart that this is real if he can just crack the code. So he begins mm. to look at certain configurations of letters and order and choosing how he's reading it, and he begins, and I, by the way, none of these documents— There are booklets and pamphlets and academic articles. When I tell you that I have a a folder that's about five to six inches filled with these that I'm translating, these have never been seen in English. Mm -hmm. And and, and they, they cover this entire period, and many of them are written by Schlotman. So he's saying, this is a whole more bite culture that you've uncovered Mm. and and so uh but the other scholars begin to challenge that view now the question becomes this is my burning question can we determine which morbidica items were 
in each each collection. Now, one thing that's important is that when Condren and Drake send the drawings to the PEF, they actually mm. note first collection, Shapira's second collection. I I held those up. You know, mm. uh, Patty took some pictures of me holding. One has got this little girl with kind of horns on her head, and there's all this <laughs> writing. And back when, remember when I used to have a Facebook page? You remember? Yeah. Well, I don't anymore, but remember? <laughs> and I posted the picture, and somebody said, Ross, what does it say? And I said, it says, my parents went to Moab, and all I got was this ugly T-shirt. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was one of my, that may be why I lost my th- privileges in Facebook for a bad joke. Now, just but, before you go on, so Dave shared <clears throat> a couple of those photos uh, on the Yachad for those who are oh, in good, there. There's um, a picture of you uh, at the PEF holding a piece of the Moabitica. Uh, great yeah. picture. I love that photo. Go ahead. Yeah, and and so <clears throat> we don't know now what I have yet to do with this um, booklet that's drawn that's uh, by Shapira <clears throat> is I have yet to go through and and work to try to find words and so forth. But what I oh. want to do first of all is look at the best arguments from people like Schlotman, who is a linguist uh, from the 1800s, and and see. Yep. What did he say? Is it possible? Is it possible? Mm. Because this well, well here's the question. Would, question. would Professor Galil consider it possible? <clears throat> that's, that's, that's uh, I'd you say know, it's at least the benchmark. Go ahead. One of the things that uh, about Galil, uh, you know, I wonder, and I know I'm maybe an alone in the world on this, but I befriended him because I, I kept thinking, what if he's right? What I if want he him turns to right. out? I do too. Mm. But if he is, and and he knows that that Ross and Jonah were his friends, then maybe uh, when this thing comes out, I can say, "Hey, you, let me tell you, you got to see this. Check this Moabitica yeah. book out." Anyway, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. so we we want to determine because I have a working hypothesis, mm. and the working hypothesis is based on the fact that I think Shapiro was an honest man. I think he's a businessman. Mm -hmm. I think he's a showman. He's a salesman. I think he's got ego. He's a salesman. Mm -hmm. But I Mm -hmm. think deep down he's an honest man. He loves God, Mm -hmm. and and he Mm -hmm. is in this for the right reason. Which, by the way, a lot of other people, even who said these are fake and even who said the scroll was fake, never spoke ill of Shapiro. Now, some did, but... A lot of them said, no, he's got a great reputation. It's just, you know, because he found a and lot of And reputation, Ross, back in the day, reputation was far weightier than it is today, generally speaking. Amen. Uh, yeah. And that, that needs to be taken into consideration as well. Yeah. Um, so the Prussians, that, so Schlopman obtains it, uh, but then Clermont Gonneau. What, what happens, Ross? Yeah, so... Claremont Gano, and I'm just going to touch on this because there is a bombshell here that I think is going to be part of a book, God willing, that I have time to write and, and really do well over the next uh, maybe couple of years. But but one thing that something about this whole culture lights a fire in Claremont Gano. Now, remember, it's 1872. And, and one of the things that he launches against is he hates this stuff. Now, I, I want to say this as politely for a, a general audience as I can. Some of these items are uh, grotesque and sexually explicit in nature, some having both male and female organs. So uh, th- these are crude items. Now, if we read, say, Numbers 21, Numbers 31, biblically, we get the idea that these Moabites are uh, dirty, nasty little people anyway, and 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 we see even <laughs> dirty, nasty yeah. little perverts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's some of, some of this material. If 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 one was to walk in into an adult store, right, and found yeah. some of this Moabitica, you'd be thinking, "Oh, this is a bit much." <laughs> Isn't that, now, this is a bit the, much. Yeah. Now the question becomes. Why did Claremont Gano? Why did he so oppose Shapira? And and let me tell you one little nugget that I found in yep. my research. I know you have a theory on this, and I, uh, I know, and, and you've heard it. I don't know who else mm-hmm. knows this, but here's the deal. Mm-hmm. I, 
I'm just saying, Jono. It's it a fact. Go so, ahead. It just so happens mm. that that Claremont Gano, Monsieur Charles Claremont Gano, the celebrated archaeolog- archaeologist and and fraud finder, his dad. Look it up. You can even mm. find it on Wiki. His, his dad's name his was, dad was Simon. His, his dad's, his dad's name, name his was, dad was his mum. <laughs> and his dad claimed to be a messianic figure. He called himself in French the Maupaw, a man and a woman. He claimed to have the organs of both because he was created in the oh, image of God. Oh, he claimed to have he the organs a- of both. Oh. Hey, man. Look, so here's the deal. So we know that Claremont Sounds like Gano, modern-day America, Ross. Um, yeah, well, I know. <laughs> now, but Claremont Gano is adopted at five. It could, I don't know yet. I'm still researching. Wait, Was he, wait, 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 wait. You're telling me, wait, because I knew some of this, but you're telling me new things now. You're yeah. telling me that uh, the Mapa, I'm learning new okay, things. This, Mapa. This, this creepy, uh, uh, the, 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 <laughs> Yeah, he's a messiah figure. So many things, a, so many things yeah. are going through my head that I can't say. Um, yeah, don't. He's, he, okay, he's saying that he's some sort of messiah figure and that he's the image of God, that he is uh, 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 both, like uh, yeah. uh, sexes. He has both genitalia is what, is what uh, he's claiming to be. But what you just said was that Claremont Gano was adopted by this man? No, no, no. You said adopted. Did no, you listen, at, at five years old, he's adopted by someone else. So let me oh, let me keep God going. So here's so the So for deal. the first five years of his life, is okay, go, go. And and is he taken, I don't know yet, I'm researching this. This is brand new, this is cutting edge. Is he taken mm. by the courts, the Child Protection Services, who say, look, uh, Simon, I'm sorry, you can be the Messiah, you can have whatever you want to have, but you, you can't have children. And, and anyway- yeah. I don't know. And did he might die? I don't know. But so Maybe long Claremont story short, today would have been uh, part of the Me Too movement. Claremont um, Gano Go ends up with another person. He grows up. I just wonder if something about this triggered something uh, that really caused him to launch out against these strange mm. figurines. Be that as it may, it's a research item. We'll find out. But what happens is he launches sort of a uh, academic holy war against Shapira's um, Moabitica, and and ultimately not just him. Now, by the way, there are others uh, soaking and couch. You, if you have the mm. Justinius Hebrew um, grammar book uh, mm. in your library there, and I'm sure you do. Couches the guy who was the German scholar who continually updated that forever and ever until he died. Mm. He's a yep. brilliant, brilliant scholar. But some of these mm. scholars wrote, and I have all of their, excuse me, I have all of their uh, booklets on condemning the Moabitica. Now, what happens is by the time 1876 rolls around, Everyone, for the most part, had said this. This is fake. The whole lot of it had been but, declared but, but Russ, forgeries. <clears throat> may, may I ask? So um, it, it seems to me like Gano and his uh, uh, and those who agree with him turned out to be the loudest voice. But there were other scholars at the time going, "No, no, no, no! This is all authentic." There were some arguing for authenticity, were there not? There were some arguing at least for some authentic, like Drake mm. is one of the guys uh, who was at the PEF who, who and Condor both argued for the authenticity. Uh, Schlopman maintained that all of it was authentic. Late, late in the whole argument, he, met, he finally admitted that some fakes may have been mixed in, but he, he maintained that it was authentic. But Drake said, I believe that initially these were authentic. In other words, he had mm-hmm. held them in the shop of Shapira. He had drawn them. He was up close. Mm-hmm. He believes that some were authentic. But here's the deal. So Shapira yeah. goes to Germany. Ultimately, they bought 1,700 pieces, according to the Huge. research, uh, yeah. for $20,000. Uh, I think it's T-H, sometimes T-A-T-H-A-L-E-R-S. Uh, I what is that my worth ignorance. today, Ross? It, well, 
I looked again today, and I even ran it through an AI model just to see. I've gotten different hmm. figures, but here's what you do, first of all. You determine that amount of money at that time, which is roughly 60000 at that time uh, it, it, for U.S. dollars. But US if dollars you look at inflation, hmm. when I wrote the book, of one of the models I used said it was uh, equivalent to four hundred thousand dollars in today's money, so roughly wow. half a million dollars. Mm. Now we do know that when Shapira got this money, that shortly thereafter he moved into the family moved from the Russian quarter, Russian colony, to a, a place that was formerly owned by Aga Rashid, called now the Tico House. Mm, and and mm. the uh, Israel Museum now owns the Tico House. We've been there. Mm. The Tylers have been there. Others have been there with us. Uh, when we go on tour, we now are bringing people to some of these sites. But right. Uh, but it, just as beautiful, as, beautiful. as, as a, sma there. a slap in the face. Not too long ago, you can look this up. People can look it up. Mm. The Israel Museum uh, allowed and was part of. Uh, a display of some of the Moabitical, which, by the way, some are still at the Tico house. But it was mm. a big thing to talk about. Truly Fake was the name of the exhibition. And everybody made fun of Shapira for being a faker in his own home, which I think is, uh, I'm going to, if if God willing, and we prove what I think is coming down from all of mm -hmm. this, they're going to eat those words. They're going to. He's going to be restored and redeemed for all this bad that they put on his name. I think so some this, of these are authentic. This becomes a question. Okay, so uh, thanks to Dave, actually, Dave brought us on an expedition. We went to the Tico House and we viewed some of these uh, Moabitical that were on display there. We Dave then took us to the American Colony, right? And uh, the American Colony Hotel. That once again, beautiful place. Um, uh, we were able to to see a couple of um, uh, Moabitica on display there as well. I think um, uh, Shimon Gibson told us that he has one. Is that is that correct? Yeah. If I remember correctly, yeah. he has yeah. a, he owns one. Um, yeah. They are around, and the question does become: Do we know what the Prussians did? Do, do, does do the Germans have it in some yeah. box down in the basement? Somewhere they went like seventeen hundred items did they just throw it all out because they thought it was fake what where let are those pieces you. let me tell you i have over the past two and a half years i have located quite a few of these now remember once they're deemed fake by 1876 the Ger mm. actually by 1874 the germans are meeting i have all their records and what they said was hey look you just Quietly go put these in the basement. Just get them. And they gave them to a young scholar, an Egyptologist. Get this, Jonah. I don't know if you know this. By the was name of Adolf Ehrman. Ehrman. Adolf Ehrman, Ehrman yeah. uh, was also involved in the Shapira scroll later. But he's an Egyptologist, and they give them to him. So and he gets say, all go this put stuff. These. Now, we have found, I have wow. found the locations of quite a few of these. And some are being tested. In fact, this month, an article is coming out in the Palestine Exploration Quarterly, which I am mm -hmm. uh, a, a subscription, I have a subscription for, by two gentlemen by the name, uh, they're Gorin Brothers. Uh, oh, yeah. The mm -hmm. Professor and Professor Gorin. So mm -hmm. I wrote with one of them back and forth to Yuval. I sent Yuval my uh, Moabite, mm -hmm. uh, my book on the Moses Scroll. He he said as soon as this article comes out, he's going to send me a copy, a PDF of his uh, his article. Right. But okay. I was watching on Twitter and saw Gorin and Gorin, the professors who are mm. experts in determining authenticity of items, and they were looking at and testing the three pieces that are at the PEF. Now, I got a news break for them. I know these are fake. I have in writing that these have already, we already know these are fake. You're looking at the wrong ones. So we need to well, find well, well, out. Yeah. Okay, but, but Ross, but Ross, in light of the, uh, the two examples that we gave at the beginning of the program, how do we really know? How do we really know that these are fake? Well, how, that's how we true. If they're, so so it, 
Do we? I mean, I'm not. Ex, I'm not an expert in any way on these. I really don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. How do we truly, truly know? Go ahead. Well, you're 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 really hitting on the heart of the matter because you know how do you test it? Well, there actually are methods that supposedly will get us close. So, in other words, when when they test and they see how this was fired, can they find certain traces of modern? firing mechanisms burned into an item such as this? Is there evidence mm. that the clay is from an area that uh, is not the area? Right. Of, so, okay. so there are tell to, mm-hmm. even if you can't determine, determine with any absoluteness that something is true or false, you can mm. get a preponderance of evidence that suggests one mm. way or the other. Now, but but I'm very curious with the current testing that's going on. Mm. I want to be involved, mm. meaning I don't have the skill sets that the professors Gorin have, but I have studied extensively into the Moabitica, and I, I have mm. some. Here, here's my plan, and I've written to them about this. If I determine in my research which Moabitica are in the first collection and and I find those items. So maybe the whole first collection has been destroyed because the Germans were embarrassed that they bought them and they told them, but but we know that we have 10 or here, 12 or here. I have email exchanges with German museums who said, yes, Mr. Nichols, we have this many in our, you're welcome to come see this whenever. We're going mm-hmm. to go look at these. Mm-hmm. What I'd like to do is get a good handle, and I've got a decent handle on where all of the known Moabitica are. Now, that excludes uh, private collectors that I just simply have no way of knowing. Mm. But my working hypothesis, Jono, is that some of these were authentic. Now, Mm. let me just tell you this. Two other points we have to cover before we close. This is a a big, big topic. Um, Number one, when, when the big push uh, suggesting that they're fake comes out, Shapira says, I'll pay. You send your people, talking to the people in Germany and, mm. and uh, England, yep. you send your people and we'll go across and you pick where to dig. And there was some of that going on and they found stuff in those locations. They still found stuff. Mm. Now, the charge was that you know, they said, well, you know, Salim and Shapira were with us. And that, that wasn't always the case, but sometimes it was. Mm. So mm. they said it would be like you and I are riding along. And let's say I salted the ground with uh, a little uh, Moabite idol. And I said, Jono, mm. I tell you what, uh, it's getting hot. Why don't we pull over and go sit in that cave? And, and uh, Salim, do you have some lemonade? Oh, you do? Hey, Jono, look. Go ahead and while you're in that corner, not that one, look, the one on your left, hey, just chip away a little bit. See, that that looks like the place where you, <gasps> you found something. You know, <laughs> so that was the charge. Now, is, is, that, is such a thing documented or, or is this in uh, later accusation? It, it, is, it is documented, that charge, but then the counter is there are people who are ministers who, and we all know that all ministers wouldn't lie, but these ministers, <laughs> I do trust some of these guys from what I know about yep. them, and and they're saying, look, nobody told me where to dig, and if you question my integrity, you know, so they're saying, no, we found really? things. Yeah. So okay. it, that that's one of the main points that I wanted to say, hmm. and then – there are a and couple that, that of other reasons. That was my point reasons. earlier on, is that yep. it is quite possible that, um, uh, that these um, uh, items were numerous and just buried in the sand all over the shop. So yeah, um, it's it's not an impossibility. Okay, you were, yeah. you were just about to say your last point? Yeah, so, so what happens ultimately is this these Moabitica items, Germany gets a bad taste in their mouth. Okay, you know mm. the 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 old expression, a bad taste in your mouth. They mm. they were burned by Shapira, Schlotman especially. His reputation was really shot after this because even when everyone else said they're fake, he's still finding word combinations with. He gets hooked on this Moabitica stuff, mm. and and so, uh, but ultimately, what happens is. Um, 
when the Moabitica is over, and by over I mean Shapira is exonerated in a sense. He's well, he's not fingered in the deal. He's not that no one says he did it. They just said he was a dupe. But mm. he gets through that, and he immediately goes and begins to find ancient man, old on. manuscripts mm. in in Cairo. You know, he, he goes on with business. But but here's so just, the deal. just just to establish the dates, uh, you said it was a four year ordeal from seventy two to seventy six, right? Yeah. yeah, and then in seventy eight something happens. So, but but keep yeah. going. Yeah, I, I'm leading up to that. So yeah, okay. So in eighteen seventy eight. The the Bedouin turn over uh, a manuscript to him that was found. Guess where in Moab? Moab. Now, mm. when when uh, uh, Guta writes his book, which by the way is now available in Kindle just this week. Mm. That's another thing we've got to mention: fragments of a leather manuscript, oh. Kindle version. There you go. But nice. look, not I don't want to get yep. off on that. Here he writes. He said, if it was found anywhere else, but why Moab? But then he goes, it sh and Guta writes this, he said, but then again, if you're a forger, why in the world would you say it was found in Moab if it wasn't? So mm. it's it can That's be right. looked at either way. But get mm. this. So Ehrman, remember Ehrman is the one that was told to dispose of the idols. Ehrman mm is the one when Guta and Meyer see the scroll and they say, we think this is real. They write Airman. Meyer mm. writes Airman and he goes, he's thinking, boys, I had to get rid of all those idols Germany bought and now you're telling me Shapira's here with a scroll? He said, I will, this was his exact telegram, I have it. He says, I'll be there on Tuesday to cool Shapira off. Yeah. Because he's the one that had to dispose of all the uh, the uh, Moabitica. Now, get this. Mm -hmm. He shows up, and when Airman shows up, he becomes convinced, in, and it says he gets caught up in rhapsody and says, mm -hmm. if those are fake, I'll eat them. Talking eat about the them. strips. Now, yeah. one more thing, and then we'll, uh, we'll kind of wrap things up. But I want to close on this point. When the scroll comes to Germany... Again, uh, I mean, again, I want to make this point. The reason that the Germans were hesitant to give the thumbs up is because they have been burnt by Shapira before. Mm. So the young guys who are in the hotel become convinced it's authentic, but the old scholars in Berlin, they're like, oh, hell no. You're not yeah. going to get me to say anything, Shapiro. We've been down this road before, young boys. You just weren't in scholarship to know it. Now, here's the funny thing. Myers writes a letter in July of 1883 to a teacher mm -hmm. of his named George Ebers. And I want to read you what George Ebers said that I think is quite amazing. Um, it, what he tells... Ebers, the older scholar, tells the young Meyer mm. he wants to know, because Meyer wants to know why the old guy shot it down. Here's his answer. Jono, the Moabitica are scarecrows, which keep clever sparrows away from good fruit. Mm. Because the Moabitica was such a bad deal, it's scaring the scholars from accepting the scroll as being mm. authentic. Now, let me tell you the problem with what's going on in scholarship today. Every modern scholar that I know of, that I've read about the Moabitica, is, well, first of all, they don't dig deeply. Number two, they accept what the other scholars said. And to this day... They buy it. They say, even if the scroll was authentic, you know, Shapiro, once a forger, always a forger. He forged an mm -hmm. entire Moabite culture. He just did. And you're like, well, have you read this, this, and this? Did you read this mm -hmm. German document? I, I don't have to. It was. So I think that the Moabitica are scarecrows, which have scared the clever sparrows away from good fruit. And if we can prove 
that any of these are authentic. Mm. You know, I already admitted that, I mean, Shapira admitted that some of these were fake too. He, he so, said, I yeah. suspect they're not authentic. It's a fascinating well, topic. It's a fascinating topic. Just one last detail, because I, I, sure. maybe you mentioned it and, and I missed it, but uh, we, we've ended here in um, 1883 and, uh, and the perception um, that, uh, that, that was a hindrance to truly viewing the, the, the scrolls objectively. But mm -hmm. in 78, Shapiro, when he first obtained these 16 leather strips, uh, attempted a transcription from the Paleo to, uh, to, to modern Hebrew, and whom did he send it to in 78? Who did he send that transcription Shlopen. to? Constantine to Shlopen. Shlopen. Did, yeah. Did we mention that? Uh, I don't think we did. I'm glad you brought it up. Just, yeah. just tell us briefly what was his reaction to that. And and and, and the question yeah. becomes: If it was Schlemann that was burned, who ended up with egg on his face by yeah. by uh, Clermont Gano loudly proclaiming that all of them are fake, all of yeah. them are fake. Um, why would Shapira send it to Schlemann? What is that about? I think the transcription I, of it's Moses excellent question. You know, Schlemann maintained the authenticity. Uh, and he and Shapira exchanged quite a bit during that time. He mm. Shapira thinks of Schlopman as a trusted friend, I believe. This is this is my view. It's what I gained from my research. So he writes Schlopman and he goes, Hey, you you will not believe this, but I now have this, this manuscript that was discovered in Moab, blah, 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 blah. Now remember, Schlopman is getting his tail whacked. In Germany, mm. by all these mm. scholars who say, get with the program, Schlopman, everybody knows it's fake. You're still hanging on to, to Shapira's fake Moabitica. Mm. So he's getting reamed out in Germany. But Shapira is, is like, one more time, just get, give me one more ear on this. And I think mm. Schlopman snaps. Schlo I have his yeah. letter, too. Schlopman writes back to uh, Shapira. First, we just had Shapira's comments to... Uh, Professor Strock about the letter mm -hmm. from uh, Schlopman. We now have that letter. Idan got that letter. He found that letter. We've transcribed it. It's amazing. So he lights Shapira up. He's like, you, I have stood up for you, and now you're telling me you found a Bible older than the Bible. How dare you? And he just lights and him up. And it doesn't even agree with our Bible, he says. Like, what, yeah. what, what are you trying to yeah. – how, how dare you even suggest that this is authentic? Um, and he really jumps down Shapira's throat as a result and, right. uh, and, and lets him have it. And as a result, Shapira decides, wait, whoa, have I stepped over a, the, the boundary yeah. here? And he goes yeah. and puts it in a bank vault in Jerusalem and he leaves it there for five years. That's from That's 78 right. to 83. And the reason why he takes it out is because he was reading uh, Introduction to the Old Testament by Frederick Bleak, uh, yeah. in which Bleak – uh, talks about uh, you know the possibility of different authors contributing to the to the Pentateuch. Yeah, One we're going to get into Eloist. we're going to get into a lot of this next we're week. Get too. Into I think all this of that. is perfect. And, and Shapira recognizes that he has an Eloist document. He takes it out and off to Europe and off to Germany. He goes and and that's where it is. That is the Moabitica scandal. Um, it's not over yet. And we're yet, what you're saying is that in the coming months um, we're going to find out more uh, once some of these are. Um, Given the once some of these pieces are given the once over Ross, is that right? I, I tell you, there there is a lot of work to be done. Um, I I would love to just sit down and write the next book, but but in my mind, I've got two major major research projects dealing with Shapiro. This is it's I, if I tried to explain, I can't express to you. You understand, uh, and others, the Tyler's people who work on this all the time know. But mm. it's very difficult to express exactly how deep this thing goes. Yes, this it's is an overwhelming the most controversial uh, subject in all of biblical literature, in uh, biblical yes. history, scholarship. Mm. The mm. the Shep the uh, Siloam inscription that I you know I've written on and spoke in Jerusalem on. This is a that's a book. I mean, mm. like you. And then this Moabitica thing has got to be mm. written. So I'm mm. just praying for more time, more energy, more uh, expeditious. I'm trying to get more able to 
get more done in a day, and and it's just mm. only so much. Now, I will say this before we close, though. I can't go into a lot of detail, but Schlokman comes in at another crucial juncture in our story, uh, and, and it has to do with an exchange between Shapira's wife and Schlokman uh, at the end. But I only want to say this because I think it's funny, and I think it's going to pay off for us to think like this. Mm. Rosette... Uh, who has to live with somebody like Shapira, I think is probably like Bridget, who has to live with me. Shapira <laughs> is probably going in and, and sh- Rosette, uh, I'll di- this is what Bridget, what'd you do today, Bridget? Oh, I planted some tomatoes. I did this. I did that. What'd you do? And then I go, listen, you're not going to believe this. The the Schlopman, you know Schlopman, I, I did, and, and she's probably like, what are you, t-? and she smiles and she says, that's great. Meanwhile, she's canning peppers or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I did if this to I William last to die, night. I <laughs> yeah, if I were to I die and, and someone asked Bridget, you know, what it what was Ross working on with Schlopman should say, I have no idea. So when <laughs> Shapira is dead, Rosette, I think, remembered something that he said mm. about Schlotman being his Schlotman. friend. But yeah. see, that that was over by the time she, mm. when he's dead. She just she didn't keep know. up because he's a nut yeah. like me. He's always talking about some biblical discovery. Yeah. And so she contacts so she Schlotman, boxes. but that's for later. We can't, we can't okay. give it away yet. All right. We can't get into that now. All right. That is today's <laughs> program. And I tell you what, I think we've done a pretty good job of it. But before we go, uh, I mentioned earlier that David uh, put a few photos on the Yakard um, group. And there's a few more there of the Moabitica that Dave's just put up. Um, oh, just yeah. remind everybody how they can become a part of this group that sees all the <laughs> well, the one other, of three uh, ways they can <clears throat> they can either join our YouTube channel, which this will premiere on YouTube. You just while you're there, click join. You're in the Yakut. It's that easy. Uh, there are three levels you can join. Whatever you can afford, the uh, four ninety nine is the base. You can also join the Patreon at any level. You're in the Yakut, or here mm-hmm. on Discord, you can join. It, it really just helps us cover the bills. It helps us to produce more content. So, yeah, we, we welcome you. We hope that you can join the Yakod. And thanks for all our Yakod members uh, for helping uh, support everything we do. This Saturday, Absolutely. Jono, the class is on Yitro, Torah reading Yitro. Uh, mm. And I cover that in Pentateuch, A New Look, after which we have a live interactive discussion here on Discord in, in Horev, but it's also played for those who aren't part of our Horeb uh, organization. They can watch it on YouTube, and Seth has it okay. so easy. They're watching the class, and when the class is over, it just automatically moves. They can sit there eating popcorn, never have to do a thing. It's that easy. <laughs> hey, That's one, one, one final thing, and then I'll turn it over to you. What? Uh, I don't know yet. Uh, there's probably going to be another item hit Amazon. Uh, this one's from uh, Ross and Seth. So I, I won't say more about that, but it might happen as early as tonight or tomorrow. It has Ooh. something to do with the Pentateuch, and uh, we're excited about it. So. Oh, okay. All right. I, see, I haven't even space. told you about this. This is a, we're not Watch this people space. think we just sit around and eat cherry bonbons. We're working here, man. This is work. This <laughs> not is just work. That. Yeah, that's right. All right. So we are heading over to the Yakad now <clears throat> for a little bit of QA. Um before we do, don't forget there is the UI conference coming up in the latter weeks of April. The last week of April, right, Ross? Is that a, that's correct? right. Eight well, it's um, April nineteenth, April twentieth, April twenty first. Beautiful. I'll make yep. sure I'm there. Uh, I'm yeah. going to be there. I'm looking forward to um, uh, seeing a whole lot of people again and meeting uh, more viewers. This is going to be great. Um, but you need to register. Ross is going to share the link and uh, got to register. Uh, just let us know right. you're coming. It's free, but we want to know that you're coming so we can cater That's right. for that and make room, make sure we have enough uh, room and uh, looking forward to that. 81st annual conference. All right. That is us. We're heading over to the Yachad right now and we will be back this time next week. That's right. Thanks, Jono.